We want to look at um, examination and diagnosis of shoulder problem with uh, the use of Celia's selective tension approach. So why is this so important? Because you know, many a times patients will come to our clinic and they'll be complaining of pain right from the bottom of the neck and they'll radiating down to the upper arm. And before we applied manual therapy especially, and other physiotherapy treatments, we need to be very sure what is the source of the pain. Is it a referred pain? Is it a pain that is localized in the shoulder joint? And within the shoulder area, is the pain coming from glenohumeral joint? Is it coming from acromioclavicular joint? Or is it coming from even the sternoclavicular joint? Or is it having some component of scapulothoracic area? We need to know whether it is the pain is predominantly due to malfunctioning of the muscle, or the capsule, or the tendon, or other soft tissues around the shoulder joint area. And one of the ways of doing that is to carry out this serious selective tension approach. I know that conventionally, when patients come to us in the clinic, what we would normally do is to do subjective assessment, isn't it? So, and then by the end of subjective assessment, we begin to have an idea of what might be wrong with the patient. Well, the use of serious selective tension does not exclude subjective assessment. You will still normally carry out your subjective assessment. You carry out your normal physical examination. But it's just an additional tool that could help us at the end if we really want to be sure where the pain is coming from and what main tissue is involved in the problem okay um next slide please right so the objective of the presentation is to hope that at the end of this presentation we'll be able to understand the basis of using serious approach which will comprise of active range of motion passive range of motion and um, isometric muscle testing in making diagnosis we also want to understand the basis of using capsular or non-capsular pattern and end feel um, in making diagnosis. The diagnosis with selective tension is not only limited to shoulder, it's just a general way serious will diagnose musculoskeletal problems. Now, um, before we go into the diagnosis, we're going to learn some concepts. Okay? We need to learn some concepts about the serious uh, selective tension. Then we will now go and um, apply it practically on the patient. One of the concepts is to say that the whole thing about the um, selective tension uh, diagnosis is centered around three concepts. The first concept is active range of motion, passive range of motion, and isometric muscle testing. They are together. The second concept is the concept of capsula and non-capsular pattern. We're going to talk about that. And then the third concept is the concept of uh, end field. Once we have done this three and we get our findings, we will, to a very reasonable extent, be able to say which of the joints around the shoulder complex is responsible for the pain. And we will be able, to a reasonable extent, to say whether it is coming from a particular tissue or not. Now, like I said earlier on, the concept of selective tension is not only applicable to shoulder, it's applicable to only any other musculoskeletal conditions. But today, we are going to demonstrate it on the shoulder anyway. The next concept, before we go into the proper diagnosis, the next concept we need to explain and understand is the concept of contractor and non-contractor structures. Right? When we say contractor structures, serious refer to tissues that are capable of contracting and generating tension in the body, you know, around the joint. And what comes to mind? The muscle, right? Beside the muscles, we'll talk about the tendon, because the tendon attached the muscle to the bone. Then there is a point where the muscle and the tendon meet. That point is called the musculotendinous junction. Okay, it's still part of the muscle. And there's a point where tendon is attached to the bone. That is tendon insertion to the bone. So when Sirius is talking about contractor structure, he's having in mind muscle, tendon, 
musculotendinous junction, tendon insertion, and sometimes bursa cannot generate tension, but sometimes bursa has located close to the tendon. So anything the tendon does will affect the pathology of the bursa. So that is why you see plus or minus bursa here. So a bursa could at a point be categorized as contractile structure if it is very close to the tendon, or it will be a non-contractile structure if it is not situated close to the tendon. So, serious will make reference to contractile structures and non-contractile structures. What are the non-contractile structures? After we have clarified that muscle and tendon are the main contractile structure, all other connective tissue around the joint, like capsules, like ligaments, like cartilage, like um, nerves, like dura mater, like fascia, will be categorized as non contractor structure because they cannot actively contract to generate tension. The other name we call them is inert structures. So we can call them contract, non contractile structures or inert structure. All right. The next concept we need to understand before we go into the diagnosis is the concept of active range of motion. We know what we use active range of motion to do in assessment anyway. As a principle in physiotherapy assessment, when you are down to assessment of movement, you want the patient to do active range of motion first, so you have an idea of what the patient can do before you now do passive range of motion. Yeah? But for this method, selective tissue tension, active range of motion is primarily used to know the willingness of patients to move that painful part. It has a little diagnostic values compared to passive range of movement and um, isometric muscle tension. But at least it is useful to test the willingness of the patient to move the joint. For example, if a patient is having painful shoulder, and you say, can you move your shoulder away from your body? So you are instructing him to carry out the movement actively. You will be able to know his willingness to move that part of the body or not. In addition to that, it also tests the integrity of the contractile structure. Yeah? Because if you instruct a patient to move the shoulder away from his body, it's going to use his muscle anyway. And muscle and tendon are part of the contractile structure. So if the contractor structure is the one causing the pain in the first instance, doing that active range of motion will necessarily make the pain worse because the muscle will have to go into contraction despite the assisting pain, right? So active range of motion could also be useful to test the integrity of the contractor structure. Then it could also provide some information of the site of the lesion, especially in musculotendinous injury. We will be able to demonstrate this point when we talk about painful arc syndrome. Okay? Right, that is painful arc syndrome there. Still, we're still talking about the active range of motion here. Please come, Yusuf. Yusuf, come, let's illustrate this. One. Or do we need this bone? Yusuf, stay here. Um, hello? If we look at this structure, maybe you should come closer now. Please. This is the shoulder joint, for example, or glenohumeral joint. So we have glenohumeral joint here, for example. We have the um, greater or the major tubercle here, and we have the lesser tubercle here. Now, we know we have quite a lot of muscles around the shoulder joints, isn't it? We have deltoid muscles on top, especially the rotator cuff muscles. Um, the, all the rotator cuff, cuff muscles, apart from subscapularis, are attached to the greater tubercle. That is the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and ter teres minor. They are all attached around the greater tubercle. It's only the subscapularis that is attached to the lip of the lesser tubercle. Now, so it means this is the tenoperiosteal junction. Right, the muscles are right from the back, from the suprascapular fossa, infrascapular fossas, and pass round, and pass round to form a tendon. So there is a musculotendinous junction about where my finger is here. Are we clear about that? The muscles are here, 
They all originated from the fossa and they pass round and pass round, form a tendon. So the tendon is around this point, and then the tendon is inserted on the greater tobacco. Do we get that? Now, the other points we need to explain here is that at, the, at about that point, they are inserted, there is an acromion process of the scapula, yeah? And there is a greater tobacco layer. And then there is coracoid process down here. And there's a ligament that runs from the acromion process to the coracoid process, coracoacromial ligament. Now, we're going to demonstrate painful ac syndrome in a while, but just imagine a patient having problem with the tendons of those rotator cuff muscles, subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teraspinatus, and you ask that same patient to do abduction and elevation, and the patient goes on like that, and goes on like that. By the time the patient moves to about 45 or 60 degree, the space between the greater tobacco, greater tobacco will be brought so close to the acromion process. You understand? So the tendon of the rotor of muscles will be rubbing either against the acromion process or the coraco acromion ligament. That will normally happen between 60 degree and 120 degree of abduction. So if the patient complains of pain around that area, we will know that it is not the muscle belly of the supraspinatus. It is not the muscle belly of the infraspinatus, but it is at the musculotendinous junction. Do you understand that? So if you want to do frictional massage or you want to do ultrasound, you will not start doing treatment on the muscle belly. Because with painful arc syndrome, apart from the fact that it tells you there's a talk of problem, it also tells you that the problem is at the musculotendinous junction. And that is what comes closer to the acromion process between 60 and 120. Degrees. Okay, so let's have a look at we're still talking about the concept of active movement. So when a patient does so look up, um, Yusuf. So if Yusuf is having a problem with his shoulder, I would say, Yusuf, can you keep your elbow straight, your palm facing forward, and take your straight arm away from your body? So you will go on like that, right? You will go on like that. When Yusuf gets to this point, if he's really having irritation of the rotator cuff muscles, it will show sign of pain at about 45 or 60 degrees. Because that's the point that the greater tubercle comes so close to the acromion process. And that contact will remain until it gets 120. It's after 120, the greater tubercle is cleared of the acromion process. So a patient with lesion of rotator cuff at musculotendinous lesion will have pain here, will have pain here, and then the pain will disappear. That is what is called painful accident. And if the patient continues till about 180 degree, and that is when the patient now feels the pain, it could also tell us that the problem is more related to the acromioclavicular joint area. You know the acromioclavicular joint area is here? The ACJ is here. So if the patient goes so straight and when it gets to the end of the range is when the pain is coming, that is more indicative of acromioclavicular joint. But if the pain comes between 45 and 120, two things. You can think of... Okay, I want you to take pictures as well. So if the pain comes between, uh, what do we say? 45, 60 to 120, we can diagnose tendino, muscular tendinous lesion of the rotor cuff muscles, or we can also suspect the subacromia bossa. That will be cooked here. But if we get to 170 and 180 before the pain comes, it is acromioclavicular joint where we'll be thinking more of having them. Now I'm going to talk about the use of passive range of motion, the concept, before we go into the diagnosis, right? Syria has also used passive range of motion in this selective tissue tension approach. We know passive motion, uh, range of motion. Passive range of motion is when the movement is carried out either by the therapist or by any other external forces, right? So Syria will normally test for the passive range of motion around the whole of the shoulder, 
And while doing that, he will take note of almost four things. One, is there pain? Two, what's the end feel? Three, is there a capsular canal? We are going to demonstrate that in a short while. But if the pain increases, like we said earlier on, if the pain increases with active rate of motion, what tissue would we be suspecting? Contractile tissue. Because it's the contractile tissue that will enable the patient to do active. And what are the contractile tissue? Muscle, tendon, musculotendinous junction, or tenoperosteal insertion. Now, if um, you should stand up, if you should come to my clinic and he's having pain in his shoulder, and I move the shoulder joint for him, I'm doing it passively. So if the problem is present in the contractile structure, while I'm doing the passive movement, you should feel less pain. The pain should not increase because I am the one now doing the movement. It's not his muscle anymore. Do you understand? Or it could so happen that you are doing passive range of motion on a patient and the patient is feeling more pain. So if you are doing passive range of motion and the patient is feeling more pain, then you will rule out the muscles. You are going to start thinking that probably you are stretching some non-contractile structures. Do you understand? And these non-contractile structures, like we said earlier on, will include capsules. It could be capsules. It could be ligaments. It could be um, cartilage. It could be any other structures that is non-contractile. Okay? So, when you think of it, how do we diagnose ligamentous problem? in orthopedics, we stretch the ligament passively, all right? How do we diagnose contractile structure? Make the structure to do movement and even put resistance on the movement and the pain will get aggravated. That's what Sirius is saying. Thank you very much, Yusuf. I will call you again. So, with the passive range of motion, if we carry out passive range of motion during this test that we're going to show and the pain aggravates, we will be thinking, that the inner structure might be responsible for the pain, then we're going to have in mind something like what? Capsule, bursa, or other non contractile structure in the joint, including the ligament. One of the concepts, again, is isometric muscle testing. So if I do isometri isometric muscle testing around the use of shoulder and its pain increases, what structure would you suspect to be responsible for the pain? Would you say, Contractor or non contractor? You're gonna say contractor because if I ask you to push your, push your hand towards me and this pain increases, what is he using to push me? The muscles is using the contractor structure. Do you get it? So, Sirius is trying to say that when you do active range of motion and the pain increases, think about contractor structure. When you do passive range of motion and the pain increases, Think about non contractor structure. When you do isometric muscle testing and the pain increases, please confirm contractor structures. Do you understand this principle? These are basic concepts that we're going to make use of in our subsequent um, demonstration. Now, before we go into the diagnosis proper, other concept we need to understand is the concept of what serious we call normal movement and abnormal movement. Because we're going to be saying that in a short while. When Celia said the movement is normal, it means Yusuf come, don't sit down here. Now, if Yusuf come to the clinic and Yusuf is complaining of pain in the shoulder, then I ask Yusuf, can you take your hands away from your body? Ooh. Then I ask Yusuf, why is your pain? I said, the pain is the same. Right? No increase. That's the normal movement. Do you understand? We just need to get used to the stand. And if we say, Yusuf, can you lift up your arm? Yeah, how do you feel? And he said, my pain is even less. When the pain is less or the pain is the same, Sylvia said, it is normal. So when you heard me saying, passive range of movement is normal, I'm saying that doing passive range of motion did not increase the pain. Do you understand? But abnormal movements, according to the terms of this diagnosis, abnormal movement will be those movements that do cause pain or aggravate the existing pain. So if I come 
and I hold Yusuf arm and I move Yusuf's arms like that and as I raise up and say, oh, my pain has increased. That means passive range of motion is what? Abnormal. Do you get it? I want you to get used to these times because we're going to be using them in the diagnosis. Right. The other concepts before we go into the um, demonstration will be the, caps the concept of capsular pattern and non-capsular pattern. We're going to explain this one. What is capsular pattern? Sit down. Yes, yes, sorry. Capsular pattern is a pattern of movement limitation that is specific to a particular joint, right? Um, it is always indicative of involvement of capsule of the joints, and it varies with different joints. Come, Yusuf. We're going to illustrate it now. This is Yusuf with a complaint of pain in the shoulder joint. Okay? So I hold on to Yusuf and I try to as assess Yusuf rings of abduction. So passively. So I move it passively like this. This is the end of the numeral joint. If I go beyond 90, I'm going, I'm doing elevation. But when you talk about the real glenomerar abduction, this is where it stops. So if I move it like this, and you of complain of so much pain. Like, I feel pain. So I will take note of that. And I can't go any further because of the pain. So we can say, ordinarily, that abduction is what? Limited, isn't it? Now, I'm done with abduction, and I say, Yusuf, just keep your hands like that, and I head on to Yusuf like this, and I move this elbow close to myself. What movement am I doing? External rotation. And Yusuf will not even allow me to go halfway because of pain. So I could also say that external rotation is limited by pain. But this appears to be much more limited than abduction. Yusuf felt much more pain with external rotation than abduction. A pattern is coming up. Do you understand? Then I said to Yusuf, now what we're going to do now is flexion. And I stabilize this scapula and I move. Ah, God, here, Yusuf says, stop. Pain. I could also say that what? Flexion is what? Limited. But I come to do extension. Yusuf was not complaining. Do you get it? I come to do media rotation. No complaint. Do you understand? So that means we have a pattern of movement limitation in the shoulder joint. What is the pattern? External rotation is most limited, followed by either flexion or abduction, then followed by internal rotation. Do you understand? That pattern shows that whatever is going on in that shoulder joint involves the capsule. Do you understand? And that's what we call capsular pattern. So it doesn't matter who the person is or who the patient is. If there is a pathology going on in the show, in the glenoid marrow joint and the capsule is involved, the patient will always be presented like that. There's going to be a pain. There's going to be movement limitation due to pain. And what's the pattern? External rotation will be most, most limited followed by either flexion and abduction. Some patients will show flexion, some will show abduction. But we know that mostly limited will be what? External rotation, followed by either flexion and abduction, and then internal rotation. So we call that capsular pattern of the shoulder joint. So anytime you notice that pattern in your patient, you know something is going on in the glenohumeral joint. And that could point to a number of pathologies. It could be adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder that takes place in the shoulder joint. It could be arthritis, osteoarthritis, or inflammatory arthritis. They all go on in the shoulder joint. So, anytime you establish capsular pattern of the glenomerular joint, let your mind go to the shoulder. Don't think of sternoclavicular, don't think of acromioclavicular, don't think of subacromia. They don't show capsular pattern. Do you understand? Are you following me? Yes. So when you get capsular pattern, let your mind be narrowing down to glenomerular joint. And inside the glenomerular joint, it could be adhesive capsulitis, it could be arthritis, osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. So Sirius is saying that when you are using this selective tissue tension, 
You've got to do active movement. We've talked about that. You've got to do passive movement. Anytime the passive movement make the pain worse, then you have to follow up by finding out is it capsular pattern or non-capsular pattern. Let's demonstrate a little bit of non-capsular pattern in the shoulder. Let us assume that uh, Yusuf is presented with shoulder pain again and I try to do passive elevation just roughly Roughly, I want to find out whether passive elevation is um, causing pain. I can do a rough movement like this If I'm going on like this, I said, ah, more pain. I know that passive movement is causing more pain Then what's the next thing that Syria said? If you find out that passive movement is causing trouble try and find out whether it is capsular pattern or non capsular and I know capsular pattern for the shoulder joint anyway. I tried external rotation and I do like this. Yusuf is not complaining. It's easy. And I do like this. He complained. He, he wouldn't even allow me to do half of internal rotation. Is that capsular pattern for the shoulder? No. Because in capsular pattern for the shoulder, external rotation is mostly dead. Internal rotation is almost like no problem. Do you understand? So. You need to clarify whenever you find out that passive range of motion is not normal. Abnormal. You remember abnormal. Abnormal is when it causes more pain or it's aggravating the existing pain. After that, then you find out whether it is capsular or. And I've just said that when you find out around the glenohumeral joint and it's capsular, where should your mind go to, please? Glenohumeral joint. Don't bother yourself about subacromia. Don't bother yourself about acromioclavicular. They don't show capsular pattern. But if a patient is having pain around this area and you try, it's not capsular, it is non capsular, then where would your mind go to? You do passive range of motion, the pain is aggravated, but it's not in a capsular pattern, it's non capsular. Then you will not even think of glenohumeral joints. What would you be thinking of? Maybe it is sternoclavicular. Maybe it is subacromia, maybe it is acromioclavicular. Are you following? I'm trying to make it easy before it gets too complex. Yes. Right. So, to further illustrate the procedure, to illustrate the proper procedure, we're going to look at the common causes of shoulder pain. Right? The causes of shoulder pain are not limited to this. I just said common causes. At least, if we are able to diagnose these causes very effectively in our clinic, we will be able to manage most patients that have complained around their shoulder, right? So, what are those common causes? We talk about glenohumeral joint arthritis, maybe osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis, and frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulder is also known as adhesive capsulitis or periarthritis. Um, another cause of shoulder problem could be supraspinatus, uh, rotator-cuff tendinitis. When the tendon of those rotator-cuff gets inflamed, and it can be supraspinatus tendinitis, infraspinatus tendinitis, subscapularis tendinitis, teres minor tendinitis. We're going to know how to diagnose them. Or it could be bicipita tendinitis. Now, what do we mean by bicipita tendinitis, guys? The bicep tendon is also located very close. There's a bicipital groove between the greater tubercle, between the greater tubercle, greater tubercle on the medial side, and lesser tubercle. There's a bicipital groove. And that is where the bicep tendon is inserted. So anytime the bicep tendon is also inflamed, we have bicepital tendinitis. Patient could just be presented like another shoulder pain. So we need to be able to differentiate between when the patient is having rotator cuff tendinitis and bicipital tendinitis. Let me show it on the board so that we will understand what we are seeing better. If you look at this sample of bone now, you are going to see the greater tubercle on the lateral side and you see the lesser tubercle on the medial side and there is a groove between the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. And that is where the tendon of the long head of biceps is inserted. So if that tendon gets inflamed, the patient will come to your clinic with pain, just like any other patient with rotator cuff tendinitis. Do you understand? 
So we should also be able to diagnose separately by septal tendinitis. We should be able to know about acromioclavicular joint atropathy or irritation, sub subacromial bursitis as well. Right. We have demonstrated active range of motion, haven't we? We're going to look at active range of motion and how do we carry it out. We look at passive range of motion, we look at isometric muscle training, then we now formulate our diagnosis. Active range of motion with selective tissue tension, no problem. We're going to get a patient like Yusuf is here. And I will say to him, keep your palm facing forward and keep your elbow straight and take your hands away from your side. Let them meet at the center if possible. You will take note of the quality of the movements and whether the patient is having pain or not, right? We have now bring it down. We have already said that if a patient is having rotator cuff tendinitis, one, there will be what? Painful arc syndrome. The pain will come at about 60 and 120. When you have a painful arc syndrome, start suspecting rotator cuff tendinitis. You might not know which one of them at this stage, but it is diagnostic of all of them. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. Why? Because it's between that 60 degree and 120 degree that greater tobacco is brought very close to the acromion process, thereby causing irritation of the tendon of those muscles. It also tells us as manual therapists that the problem is not in the belly of the supra or infraspinatus, but it is at the tendon muscle insertion, the junction between the tendon and the muscle insertion. Thank you, Bezo. Yes. Now, the passive one. How do we now do the passive range of motion? Uh, the passive range of movement test. Because we have to do active range of movement test, passive range of movement test, isometric muzzle testing. So that's what Syria said. How do we do the passive range of movement test? We're going to show it one by each now, so just focus on me now. So if you want to do this one, why doing the passive range of uh, passive range of movement test, you need to also be conscious of finding out something about hand feel. Right? We're going to talk about the hand feel in a short while. Now, we're done with the passive range of motion, that's okay. Now, now I'm looking at passive range of motion. And we know the most important movement around the shoulder joint based on serious method. External rotation, flexion, abduction, internal rotation. All you can do. All the movements if you like. There's a quick way of finding out. Before you test each of those movements in isolation, there's a quick way of finding out whether passive range of motion is normal or abnormal. You remember normal? Normal means it's not causing pain. Abnormal means it's causing pain. What you can do simply is to hold the elbow joint and keep going, keep watching the countenance of the patient. If the patient is not showing any series of pain, throw the hands like this and push the back of the elbow and then see what the patient will be saying. If the patient squeezes his face, generally passive range of motion is abnormal. Do you understand? That could be a quick test to do. You can now progress to finding out one after the other, which one is mostly affected. What are we after? Because we want to establish the capsular pattern. You remember, whenever the passive range of movement is abnormal, then you have to establish whether there is capsular pattern or non-capsular pattern. So what next am I going to do? I want to test for the flexion. You're going to face here now. I want to go to get this one. This is very important. When you want to do passive range of flexion, you will have to stabilize the scapula and the clavicle. So one hand will stay on the scapula and the clavicle. The other hand will pick this up. You know, this, don't move it out. You move it yourself until you get to a point the joint is not moving again due to pain. Do you understand? That's it. So that's flexion. Are we good? All right, so you take note of the pain, you take note of the restriction, you take note of what the patient will complete. Extension can also be done in the same manner, right? You can push it back. No more movement here. If I go any further here, I'm going to go into elevation. Do you understand? Right? That's the hand, but the patient is not feeling pain. The patient would not normally feel pain with extension. Important to stabilize the scapula and the clamp. If I remove my hand, if, if, I, if I do away with the stabilization of the scapula and thoracic, elevation will take place. Do you understand? 
But if you want to limit to glenomerular flexion, it is important that the scapula and the clavicle are stabilized. No more movement here. Do you understand? So that's what we do with the flexion. Are we good? Now, and extension. Now, the other important movement in glenomerous um, assessment is external rotation. And you know, for external and internal rotation, the patient will have to flex the elbow and keep the elbow to the side. And you will now block that with the body of the therapist. Right? So you can keep this one like this, and you keep this one like this. You can move back a little bit because we want to do external rotation. So you move the wrist toward yourself. Now the movement is stopped. Do you understand? It's stopped now. So that's the end. And I can get the hand feel. It's a firm end feel. I'm going to talk about end feel for the shoulder, for all the shoulder joint movement. Now, so there is no limitation here, obviously, because Yusuf is not having problem. If he's having problem with his shoulder, perhaps we'll go here and then we'll stop. We take note of how much limitation. Um, flexion and extension. Internal rotation. I know that you know, we've said it in the class, that's internal rotation. For the purpose of using selective tension, this is what I will advise that you do. Get the hands like this. Now, many of these patients usually have problem to walk their hand on their back. So putting the hand on the buttocks might be tolerated by the patient. So what you have to do then is to stay close to the patient like that, brace this part, guess this wrist and move it out a bit. Then you'll be causing some internal rotation. Kolo, do you get this? Yes, sir. Okay, then you'll be doing some internal rotation at the shoulder. This is the end, it can't go any further. I'm getting the end feel already. All right, so we'll take note of the limitation and we'll take note of the pain as well, okay? Today there's no cause, we're doing one long video. So we're gonna talk about the end feel. Shall we quickly talk about the end feel? Sit down for the therapist feel the impact of the movement on the therapist's hand at the end of the passive range of motion. At the end of the passive range of motion. Let's, let's illustrate it again. Let's illustrate this end feel again. You know, when we want to do extension, what do we do? Stabilize the scapula and the clavicle and move this hand back like this. Now it's not going anymore. What am I feeling here now? It's feeling firm. There are different types of end feel that Sirius described, but the most common one I want you to remember are the bony end feel, soft tissue end feel, firm end feel, springy end feel, and empty end feel. What is bony end feel? You can have an idea of what bony end feel is if you do extension of the elbow on the patient. By the time you move the elbow to full extension, it feels like bone is rubbing on bone very hard. That is bony end feel. Then you can get a feel of what is soft tissue end feel is by doing elbow flexion. If you push this arm into flexion, it feels soft. So what is firm end feel? Firm end feel will be somewhere in between. Bony end feel is not as hard as bony. It's harder than the soft. Do you get it? So that would be the firm end feel, right? And springy end feel, by the time you're trying to do the movement, the patient will push back to your hand due to pain in a springy manner. That's a springy end feel. Empty end feel, while you're trying to do that, the patient will take his hand away from you. So you have no end feel at all because of the pain. That is empty end feel, all right? Now for shoulder joints, the normal end feel for flexion, for extension, for abduction, for all the movement is firm end feel. All the end feel should be firm. Now what now happen if I'm doing flexion on the shoulder joints and I'm not getting firm end feel, I'm getting bony end feel. But I should get firm end feel because firm end feel is what is normal for the shoulder joint. But as I'm moving like that, I'm getting bony end feel. It means something is blocking the joint. Do you understand? So we can straight away diagnose internal derangement. Something is present inside the joint blocking the movement of the joint. And that's the language of internal derangement. Maybe we're going to need x-ray or something to be able to get that. For example, there could be calcific tendinitis. 
there could be a deposit of bone-like materials inside the joint. Bone-like materials inside the joint in form of calcific tendinitis. In that case, you do that flexion, it will hit like bone. Even before you get to the hand range, you can do external rotation. It's going to stop you like bone. It will be firm. It will be very hard and filled with so much pain. Do you get it now? That's the importance of end field in this procedure. Thank you, you sir. You can see that. Um, yeah. Passive range of motion. Whenever you do passive range of motion to the shoulder joint and it's abnormal, which means it's causing more pain, Syria said, go ahead, establish whether there is what? Capsular pattern or non capsular pattern. And what is capsular pattern? External rotation is most limited, followed by flexional abduction and then followed by internal rotation. The next thing is what? Isometric muscle testing. We've done active, passive, isometric muscle testing. How do we test for that? Now, this is very important because this is where we're going to stop talking about diagnosis of rotocuff tendinitis. Yeah? If you do this one very well, we can stop everything about the diagnosis of rotocuff tendinitis here. So we have to put resistance to the action of all the muscles around the shoulder joint. Before we can apply isometric muscle testing, we will need to know the action of those muscles. Yeah? Let's talk about deltoid, for example. What's the action of deltoid? Deltoid span round anterior, media, posterior part of the shoulder. Because it goes anterior, deltoid is responsible for what? Flexion. Because it is lateral or media, it's responsible for what? Abduction. Because it's posterior, it's responsible for what? Extension. Right? But let's focus on the rotor of muscles. Supraspinatus. Infraspinatus, subscapularis, and trisminus. Supraspinatus, the main function of supraspinatus is what? Abduction. It does abduction. So if you want to do isometric muscle testing for supraspinatus, you can hold here just to stabilize him. You can either choose to bend the elbow slightly or you leave it like this and you ask the patient to push away the therapist's hand. Can you push my hand away? Do you see? Then I'll ask the patient, do you feel no? I'm, I'm assessing two things. Now, please, before you say that isometric muscle testing is abnormal, you've got to think about two things. One, is the movement causing more pain? Is the movement showing signs of muscle weakness? Do you understand? So for isometric muscle testing to be an abnormal, it could be because it's causing pain. It could be because it's showing signs of muscle weakness or both but for passive range of motion for it to be abnormal it means it's causing pain do we do we get it so if i'm testing supraspinatus tendinitis i said can you push my hand away from you i'm assessing the strength and the pain so do you feel pain if you said yes and the strength looks normal then i'll conclude that Isometric muscle testing on the supraspinatus is abnormal with more pain but no muscle weakness. Do you understand? But if I said do the same thing, now go on, and there's no pain, but I feel the movement is weak, the resistance is just coming and going, I'm going to conclude that the isometric muscle testing this time is abnormal with no pain and muscle weakness. Do you understand? And it is also possible to say, go on, push my hand away. I feel that there is pain and there is also muscle weakness. So I'm going to conclude that the isometric muscle testing is abnormal with pain and muscle weakness. These three things have different diagnostic values. That's why I said it's complex, but it's not complex. By the time you start using it, you get used to it. So, before you go, Yusuf, we're going to show supraspinatus, isometric muscle testing. Stabilize this part and ask the patient to push your hand away. Just keep it about less than 18 degrees because that toy take over from 18 degrees to 90 degrees. If you are doing resistance there, you are not testing supraspinatus. You are testing that toy.
for suprasmenal to so keep it low. And say, can you push my hand away from you? So you test for the pain and the strength, okay? That is supraspinatus. What about infraspinatus? Now, let's leave infraspinatus alone for now. Um, yeah, infraspinatus. Infraspinatus is the external rotator or the lateral rotator. How do we do that? Yeah, the hand here. Yeah. You know what we did before? Just brace this part, move back a bit, put your hand there, keep your elbow to your side, and uh, push my hand away with your own hand. Yeah? What am I assessing, guys, again? Pain and weakness. Do you understand? Is this giving him pain? Does the movement feel weak as well? Alright? That would be for the infraspinatus and tennis minor. Now, listen, guys. Tennis minor is so abnormal muscle. It's always accompanying all other muscles. It doesn't have a mind of its own. This is supraspinatus, for example. This is a test for what? Infraspinatus. Well, when you're testing for infraspinatus, you're also testing for tennis minor. Now, if you want to do subscapularis, the action of subscapularis is what? Internal rotation. You can keep the muscles like that. Put your hand like this. Now, take your wrist to your elbow and push my own. So I'm assessing for pain and I'm assessing for strength, okay? Right. When you are testing for subscapularis, you are also testing for tourism. Do we understand that? Right? And let's say, let's assume that by the time we do this test, listen guys, we've done painful heart syndrome, it's positive. We started thinking, oh, it could be one of those rotator cuff muscles because of painful heart syndrome. Then you do this one. This is for what? Supraspinatus. Now push my hand away and you should complain of more pain. Ah, we pass with our supraspinatus and we do this one. So push my wrist away. Mm, same pain, the pain is not much. So it is not infraspinatus. Although painful heart syndrome shows all the rotator cuff, but selective text did not show involvement of infraspinatus. It only shows supraspinatus. Do you understand? Or maybe you do the supraspinatus, not much pain, it's just the same pain. And then you do external rotation, not much pain, just the same pain. And then you do this one, and you complain of too much pain here. This is internal rotation, and that is for what? Soft scapularis. So painful heart syndrome shows generally there is a problem, but where is the problem is resisted. Movement test will show where it is. Are we clear? Okay, thank you. Let's keep it very simple and low so that you do serious active passive isometric muscle testing. You are going to have three groups of diagnosis. In the first group of diagnosis, you can find out that the passive range of movement is what abnormal. What do we mean by abnormal? Because the pain is what increasing but the isometric, the isometric muscle testing is normal do you understand so you come come and so you're assessing the patient you do this one you want to know roughly whether the capsule is involved the patient said pain oh okay then you do this one passively more pain and then you do this one maybe more or less pain and you do this yeah more pain that's external rotation, that's more pain. So all these movements are what? Passive movements, and they are causing pain. So we say passive range of motion is what? Abnormal. But by the time you try the uh, isometric muscle testing, the strength remained the same. This, the isometric muscle testing did not cause more pain, and there's no weakness. So you're going to categorize that as what? A diagnosis group where the passive range of movement is abnormal, but isometric muscle testing is what? Normal. Do you get that? Seriously, so when you get that, start thinking of adhesive capsulitis. But you know there's one thing he said. When you find out that PROM is abnormal, what should you do next? Find out whether it is capsular or non-capsular. We're going to talk about that in a while. The second group of diagnosis would be a situation whereby you find that isometric muscle testing is abnormal. Why? Because it's causing more pain. 
but the PROM is what? Normal. It could happen. Do you understand? Come here, soup again. This could be a situation. The patient come. You want to know roughly whether PROM is going to cause a problem. You do this one. Uh, Yusuf said, I still have pain, but it's just my same pain. So you don't bother yourself about passive anymore. You just do this. Now push my hand away. Oh, pain. Where? Here. That isometric testing is what? Abnormal, isn't it? Maybe you test one or two more muscles and pain increases. Do you get it? So we can say in this category, PROM is normal, but isometric muscle testing is what? Abnormal. But don't forget, before we said isometric muscle testing is abnormal, it could either be because the isometric muscle testing is producing pain or weakness or both. Okay? The third category, the worst category, is the one whereby both PROM is what? Abnormal is causing pain. Isometric muscle testing is also causing pain. Are we good? We're going to talk about their diagnostic values later. Can we go to the next one? Now, how do we make use of this information? When you find out that PROM is abnormal, but isometric muscle testing is normal, what did Syria said? Go further ahead to find out whether it is what? Capsular or non capsular. So, if you now find out it's capsular, what did I say, please, guys? When you find out it's capsular, you should be thinking the diagnosis should be where? Inside the glenohumeral region. Are you clear? Yes. If the passive range of motion is abnormal and you ask yourself, is this capsular pattern or not? And it is capsular, please don't bother yourself thinking about uh, subacromia bursitis or acromioclavicular joints or anything here. Just know that the, the pathology is where? Inside the glenomerular joint. And if it is inside the glomerular joint, it can be arthritis, it can be adhesive capsulitis. Do you understand? So that's what Syria is saying. If it is capsular, you'll have this pattern. External rotation is mostly limited. Followed by flexion, followed by internal rotation. If it is non capsular, let's say that we have passive range of motion is abnormal, right? But it's not capsular pattern. Then what do you think, guys? You will rule out glenomerular joints. And you start thinking it might be what? Subacromial bursitis or acromioplavicular joints. Are you with me? Or it could be due to some other conditions which we are going to see but at least at this stage if it is non-capsular rule out glenomerular joint it can be it cannot be arthritis it cannot be adhesive capsulitis it's got to be a problem maybe a problem with other joints like subacromia area or acromioclavicular joint but if it is capsular focus on what glenohumeral joint i want us to start from simple area before we make it a bit complex. Yes, this one. Thank you. If we do isometric muscle testing and we find out that it is abnormal, why? Because it's increasing pain. You know, Syria said we should find out whether that isometric muscle testing is causing pain and no weakness. You know, there could be three possible options. We have pain and no weakness. Or we have weakness and no pain, or we have both weakness and pain because the three of them are going to tell us a lot. Now, come Yusuf, let's go straight to them. Okay, for Yusuf, with shoulder pain, I just try to find out with the state of the cap. So, Yusuf is fine, the pain is still there, but it's not too much. It's okay, so passive range of motion is normal. I want to do isometric muscle testing, then I do this one. Can you push my hand away, please? And use of complaint of pain, but the strength is there. That will be what? Pain and no weakness. Do you understand? Oh. Push my hand away. There is weakness, but it's not feeling any pain. So that would be weakness and no pain. Or you could just I could just say, can you push my hand away? It's still having too much pain and the muscle is very weak. So that would be what? Weakness and pain. They have three diagnostic, three different diagnostic values. When you get pain and no weakness, you can almost be certain that 
the problem will be rotokoffs and bicep tendinitis, right? They should, you know, it's tendinitis. It's inflammation of the tendon or the tendon sheet. The pain is the priority here rather than the muscle weakness. These muscles around there don't get weak quickly, but they show signs of pain and discomfort a lot because of the tendinitis. So you can always be sure that when you do pain, no weakness, you can start suspecting a to talk of tendinitis. But we'll come to that in a short while. Next one, please. Uh, yes, when you carry out passive range of motion at the glenomerular joint, this is the third category. We have three categories. The first category is when you do passive range of motion, it's abnormal. Isometric muscle testing is normal. I will play about that. The second category is just about isometric muscle testing. It doesn't involve passive range of motion is what normal, but isometric muscle testing is what abnormal. What's the third category? Both the passive range of motion and isometric muscle testing are abnormal. Do you understand? And you know when passive range of motion is abnormal, what is serious that we should do? Go and find out is it capsular or non-capsular. And he also said when you have isometric muscle testing, you need to find out whether it is what? Pain, no weakness, weakness, no pain, or weakness and pain. Now come, you see. This third category is the one that wants to make it a bit complex. But really, it's not complex. Let's say Yusuf come to the clinic with shoulder pain again. I try to see the degree of involvement of the capsule. And Yusuf said pain. Oh, I can write down. Passive range of motion is what? Abnormal, isn't it? I don't have time. I want to go to isom isometric muscle testing. I can push my hand away. Oh, pain. I can also write down that what? Isometric muscle testing is what? Abnormal. Pain, no weakness. Or weakness, no pain. Or pain and weakness. You need to make that comment. Do you understand now? Now, sit down, Yusuf. How do we now? This third one is the one that is a bit more challenging. How do we now, if we find out in a single patient that the PROM is abnormal, isometric muscle testing is abnormal, how do we combine all these things together to make diagnosis? For example, in that single patient, he can be having a capsular pattern with pain and no weakness. And he can be having a capsular pattern with what? Weakness and no pain. It's a possible combination, isn't it? And he can be having a capsular pattern with weakness and pain. Or it can be a non-capsular pattern in any combination of this. But we'll try and make it simple. Next slide. Ah, uh, you know, when you do active range of motion, we are rounding up on the clock off here. Is they are very they are the easiest to diagnose, so to say. How do we diagnose the talk off muscles? When you do active range of motion and there's painful arc syndrome, you start thinking. There's a problem at the musculotendinous junction. Rotator cuff. Then what else do you have to do? Resist the isometric muscle testing for the bicep. Uh, you do isometric muscle testing for the what? Supraspinatus. If it's positive, you can just confirm supraspinatus tendinitis. For the infraspinatus, like we have shown, for the sub. Oh, I don't think that picture is very clear, so let's just show it like this. So for rotator cuff tendinitis, the first thing to do is what? Painful arc syndrome. Take your hand, palm forward. Take your hand away from you. Pain at 45, pain at 120. You take note of that. And you really want to find out it is rotator cuff. The second test you need to do is what? Isometric muscle testing. Push my hand away. Pain will confirm supra spinatus or okay push my wrist away with your own pain will confirm what infraspinatus can you move your wrist to your abdomen pain here will confirm what that is okay for serious as far as we talk of is concerned but you know we said earlier on that the bicep tendon also passes through between the lesser and greater tubercle so you need to test for the biceps as well how do we do that What's the action of bicep? Flexion of the elbow, isn't it? So just put resistance here. Go on. And the patient complain of more pain. Where? Here. In the bicipital groups, guys. You can simply confirm that it is bicipital tendinitis. 
If you don't find out, you can just be treating it the wrong area and the patient will not get well. You can just think it is some back home and you put in your ultrasound there, whereas this is where you really need to apply your ultrasound because that's where the bicep tendon is. Do you understand? Or if you find out it is supraspinatus tendinitis, where do we get the tendon of uh, supraspinatus tendinitis for massage? Do that, expose this, and then you come here. Do you still remember that? Yes. So this specific diagnosis really helps you to direct your movement. And if it is tendon of infraspinatus, maybe you do this one and you push back and pain. Would you be doing your ultrasound there? The patient will not get better. Will you do your frictional massage there? It will not get better. Because where do we get the tendon of infraspinatus? Around here. This is where we normally get the tendon of infraspinatus for frictional massage. Do you understand? So we need to know the specific muscles out of all the rotator cuff muscles. After we got a painful arc syndrome, then we have to resist the action of each one of them so that we know where to direct the movement. Is that clear? So definitely the diagnosis of rotator cuff can stop here. Let's see that. What about the other one? Um, a situation where we find out that the passive range of motion is abnormal and isometric muscle testing is also abnormal. Do you get it? Passive range of motion is ab abnormal and isometric muscle, muscle testing is abnormal. You know when isometric muscle testing is abnormal? It could be due to two things or combination of two things. Why? Pain or muscle weakness. Come on. We'll soon finish. Now look at this. Yusuf is having pain around there when it comes to my clinic. I just want to do a quick check on the passive range of motion. I just do that. Pain. All right. Passive range of motion is what? Abnormal. Right? But it is non capsular. I'm not going to worry about the glenomerator. The next thing I'm going to do is to do the resistance. Go on. Pain. Push here. Maybe pain, push here, maybe pain. So I'm gonna say passive range of motion is abnormal. Isomorphic muscle testing is also abnormal with pain. You can start thinking of the subacromial area or the acromioclavicular joints. Alright? Can put it together. Subacromia and acromioclavicular joints. Passive range of motion will be abnormal, but it will be non-capsular. Isometric muscle testing will be abnormal, but it will just be pain. Do you get it? No weakness. If you get pain and weakness, it must be a very acute subacromial bursitis. Very recent. And the pain is what is inhibiting the muscles, producing that weakness. Do we get it? Next one. This is that. Now that's the one I'm talking about. You have a patient and passive range of motion is abnormal. Isometric muscle testing is also abnormal with pain and weakness. Right? For the subacromia ACJ, the IMT is abnormal, but it should be just pain. That's when you, you confirm chronic subacromia bursitis or ACD. But if you have both pain and weakness as a result of the isometric muscle testing and PRM is also abnormal, what would you think of? Acute ACD or acute subacromia bursitis. There should be no muscle weakness with that. They're just a joint far away from the muscles. But when, they are present, when the patient is presented with pain and muscle weakness on isometric muscle tension, it's because those areas are Acutes and the pain itself is inhibiting the muscle action. Next one, please. So let's have a quick revision before we stop. Group one, in terms of diagnosis, passive range of motion only is what abnormal. Isometric testing is good. In the group two, isometric muscle testing only is abnormal. Maybe passive range of motion is good. In group three. Both PRON and IMT is abnormal. Can I quickly ask? No, don't change it. Don't change it. We want to wrap up and be making diagnosis together now. 
What did Syria say we should do if passive range of motion is abnormal? Find out whether it is what? Capsular or non-capsular. If you find out it's capsular, what would you want to diagnose? Problem inside where? Glenohumera mm -hmm. joints. And what are the likely problems in the glenohumera joints? Adhesive capsulitis, frozen shoulder, or arthritis. Are we clear with this one? Yes. Now, if you come to the second, the second rule, PROM is good, but isometric muscle testing is weak. Is that contractor or non contractor in nature? If the isometric muscle testing is abnormal, contractor. Because what do we do? We're putting resistance on the muscles. If that causes pain, that's contractor. What should come to your mind? Oh, it's not joint. It should be those muscles, isn't it? Right? So what do you do? You go around and test what the will talk of and the bicep tendon. Now, if you now have a thought group whereby the PROM is abnormal and the IMT is also abnormal, guys, that is when you will start thinking of subacromia and a CD. Are you with me? If it's just PROM and the scapsula, be no joint. If it is just isometric muscle testing, no PROM, what do you think of? Muscles. You think of rotocuff muscles and bicep tendons. And you have specific text to the tendon. If it is both PROM, that is abnormal. And isometric muscle tension is also abnormal. What do you think of? You think of subacromiabositis and acromioclavicular joints. How do we differentiate between this one? We have to use selective operation. We'll come to that one. But if PROM is abnormal, IMT is abnormal, well, according to Sirius, he said we should find out whether it is capsular or non-capsular. For both ACJ and subacromia, will it be capsular or non-capsular? Non-capsular. It's only glomerular joint that will give you what? Capsular. Do you understand? So these guys, ACJ and subacromia will give us non-capsular. Now, what about the IMT? What should they give us? They should give us pain, but no weakness. Then we know it is chronic subacromiabositis and chronic, chronic ACJ. But if you have non-capsular PROM and you have pain on IMT and you have weakness, then it is what? Acute ACJ or acute subacromia. Now, how would we now differentiate between subacromia and ACJ? Well, Syria said you can use selective, pal selective palpation. That's where your knowledge of anatomy will come in. You know, this is acromion process. This acromion process, this coracoid process. Sub coracoid bursitis is here. If you palpate on this area, the patient will feel pain. And then you palpate on this area, the patient will also feel pain. So you can compare the pain that the patient feels on the good side with the abnormal side. If the pain on the abnormal side is more than the good side, then there is subacromia bursitis. Are we good? So we can always differentiate between subacromia and ACJ based on the anatomical orientation. We are almost done. I, I think I've already said all of the slides, but just let's go through them. Next one, please. So, this is exactly what I've said. If you have passive range of motion abnormal with a capsular pattern. Huh? Passive range, capsular pattern. When you have capsular, where should your mind go to again? Glenomerate. Do you understand? Don't think about ACG or subacromia. If it is capsular, it is glenomerate. You'll be thinking of what? Inside the glenomerate joint, there could be what? Adhesive capsulitis. There could be arthritis osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis. Next one, please. If we have passive range of motion is abnormal, caps with non-capsular. Huh. Now, passive range of motion is there, non-capsular. So, it can't be arthritis. It is non-capsular. It can either be because the movement, there's been previous subluxation and there's abnormal movement around the shoulder joint. That's why it's not showing the specific capsular pattern. It can be because the patient is having hypermobility syndromes. 
or it can be due to all other problems because it is non-capsular. What are the other problems that you can think of? Uh, maybe subacromiabocytes, maybe a chromioclavicular joint because it comes with non-capsular. Okay, next one, please. If a patient is having isometric muscle testing, with ab which is abnormal, with pain, no weakness. Pain and no weakness. You do those things, there's pain, but the weakness is not there. Oh, forget it. It's rotator cuff tendinitis. They don't usually get weak like that. But they always produce pain with isometric muscle testing. Do you understand? So, um, is this the next one? Yeah. Uh-huh. If we now have a patient that is having isometric muscle testing is abnormal with, look guys, weakness, no pain. It's having weakness but no pain. What is happening here? For a muscle to be weak, yeah, it's weak and it's not causing pain. Nerve is involved. It's not just the muscle and the tendon thing we're talking about anymore. A nerve is involved either at the central level or at the peripheral level. At the peripheral level, you can be thinking of radiculopathy. At the central level, it could even be um, upper motor neural lesion or something like that. So if there is isometric muscle testing producing weakness and no pain, you can think of tendon rupture, or you can think of nerve conduction problem of central or peripheral origin. Okay? Capsular pattern. Again, where is that taking you to? Glenomerular joint. Anywhere you see capsular pattern, go back to glenomerular joint. Don't think too much. Don't think too much. It must be glenomerular joint when it's capsular. But this time around, there is no pain. Right? Now it's glenomerular joint. Why is there no pain? Well, because the problem has been long standing. Many of these adhesive capsulitis, when it happens, you will see the capsular pattern and pain. But after some time, the patients have taken some analgesics, they have done little movements on their own, their pain will come down. But there will still be limitation of movement, which will show capsular pattern. So when you see capsular pattern with little or no pain, it is still arthritis. It is still inside the glenomerular joint. But it just gives you an idea, it's a long-standing case. And the patient is getting spontaneous recovery. Okay, next one. When we have a capsular pattern movement with pain and weakness, that's there is capsular pattern, listen, and there is pain and there is weakness. Now, because it is capsular pattern, what do I say to you? Take your mind to where? Yeah. Glenomerage. Why is there pain and there is also weakness? Then it's not just the arthritis, it's a more acute condition inside the joint, like due to infection septic arthritis or gout okay but capsular pattern will still tell you it is right inside the glenomerular joint next one non-capsular pattern now with pain and no weakness when i say, when it is non-capsular where do we go subacromia or acromion clavicular joints and there is pain and no weakness that's a classical case chronic case of bursitis, chronic case of ACD. That's the most presentation we have in physiotherapy clinic. They will show non-capsular, they will show no weakness. Because it's non-capsular, forget about the glenomerular joint, focus on subacromial bursa, focus on acromioclavicular joint. Next one. Non-capsular pain and weakness. There's now pain, there's also weakness. I said normally there should be no weakness because this non-capsular, where will it take your mind to? Acromioclavicular joint or subacromiabocytes. It should normally produce pain but no weakness. When you have weakness, then you've got to think it could be a very acute condition. Acute condition can inhibit, can cause pain that will inhibit muscle strength. So the patient is presented with muscle weakness. It could also be due to fracture, dislocation, or cancer in that area. That's a very abnormal stage. I think we are almost done. Other diagnostic indicators, apart from active range of motion, passive range of motion, and um, 
Isomer isometric muzzle uh, testing we can use will include hand fields. I think we've talked about hand fields. So while you're doing those passive range of motion, you need to get a feeling in your hand. For shoulder joint, the normal hand feel should be firm. Something in between bony and soft. So when you now get bony, it's abnormal. It means something is blocking the joint. So order the patient to go and do x-ray or scan. You will see what is blocking the joint there. Whether it's a sheep of bone or whether it's calcium deposits. A soft bone that is forming within the tendon. So the end field will give us an indication. X-ray will confirm that or scan will confirm that. Then like I said, finally, Sirius also advocate that we use selective palpation. And on the final note, the use of Sirius does not exclude all other tests you know before. Empty cans test, Kennedy test, yeah. uh, near test, you can still do them. But I tell you, if you are used to Sirius, and the only way you get used to Sirius is to practice it often and often. If you are used to Sirius, you will not use, you will less likely use those other tests again. But it becomes so spontaneous with you, by the time you see the patient within three or five minutes, you already know where the problem is coming from. For example, if I ask you, a patient come and passive range of motion is abnormal, it is a non-capsular pattern, Isometri isometric muscle testing is abnormal, just pain, no weakness. What do you think? Is wrong for the patient. Do you want me to repeat it again? No, no, no just once again. Passive range of motion abnormal with capsular pattern. Mm -mm, sorry, passive range of motion abnormal with non capsular pattern. Isometric muscle testing abnormal with pain, but no weakness. So I can't. Uh, I can, uh, See? So we just talk. Within five minutes, you make the diagnosis. But if you want to go through the long list of doing things, it takes you a while. That's the benefit of serious. But you don't get to be an expert until you practice. Or a patient just come and say passive range of motion is abnormal. Passive range of motion is abnormal with capsular pattern. With capsular pattern, then you do isometric muscle testing, pain. No weakness. What's your diagnosis? Do you want me to repeat it again? Passive range of motion abnormal with capsular pattern. Isometric muscle testing pain. No weakness. Now, the fact that I said capsular pattern should take your mind to where? Glenomeratron. Now we said pain. No weakness. Usually that's what you get. Either adhesive capsulitis or rotator cuff or bicipital tendinitis. And you know how to differentiate between these three. So when you get used to this series, it's easy. Oh, you can call it now. 